It's, of course, mixed emotions in some respects that we speak this week about the passing to glory of one of God's generals, Jerry Savelle. Quite sudden, I think it was Monday, and he preached the day before. And um, I remember many years ago getting Jerry's books, tapes, and actually seeing him uh, in person uh, preaching down in uh, Brighton. And so quite a sad occasion for us, but a glorious homecoming for him. And so we, we honour God's servant, uh, God's man of God, uh, the man of God, uh, Brother Jerry. And um, anyway, we press on. And, you know, when some general dies or some man or woman of God goes to glory, they, they hand the baton over. Amen. So it's on us now when people pass on to be with the Lord. And many have. And in recent times, we've seen uh, generals. In fact, since the beginning of the century, many generals have gone to glory. Brother Hagen, Oral Roberts, uh, Billy Graham. Uh, but, you know, that ought to be an encouragement in a sense to us because what it means is God is entrusting us with the message, with the gospel, uh, and with kingdom priorities, okay? And that's why we meet on a Saturday morning to be about the business of his kingdom, to be about our Father's business. And so we're going to continue this morning looking at what we looked at last week, which was the Eliakim mandate, the Eliakim mandate, Eliakim, of course, means God rises or even God raises. Um, and it reminds us of Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, and uh, arise, shine, your lights come. And that's really what the Eliakim mandate is all about for us to arise in the earth. Uh, welcome to Liga by the Liga. You like my hardcore whiteboard? It's better than the college one, isn't it? Uh, so anyway, praise the Lord. Mm. So... Isaiah chapter 22, let's just refresh ourselves, uh, our understanding or our memory with these verses. This is a very important scripture. There are two places in the word of God that the key of David is mentioned explicitly. You can find it in other places, sometimes in coded form, but explicitly mentioned as the key of David or the key of the house of David. This is one of them and the other is in Revelation chapter 3. So let's look at this one here, and I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. Um, a wonderful present of the Amplified Classic Edition, published by Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And uh, I really love this Bible. Thank you, dear one, for that. Uh, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 15. Come go to this contemptible, it says here in the Amplified, because that's what it means, steward and treasurer. This is a prophecy through the prophet Isaiah to the man who was the chamberlain or right-hand man of the king of Judah, the house of David, the, the, the throne of David at this time. To Shebna, and you notice here God calls him a treasurer. And what that means is, is that this man Shebna, his heart is intent on financial gain. Okay, he was over the financial dealings of the palace but, you know, you can be over the financial dealings uh, without being a Judas or without being someone who covets money. But this man was clearly someone who coveted prestige and position and finances. It says, come go to this contemptible steward and treasure to Shebna, who is over the house, but who is presumptuous enough to be building himself a tomb among those of the mighty, a tomb worthy of a king, and say to him, Shebna had used a lot of money to buy a tomb among the nobles of the city or the nobles of the nation and to, to show he was an important man. And I think the implication here, it's not saying it explicitly, but I think the implication is he may have used public money to buy it. Amen? Uh, but it says, this is what to say to him, what business have you here and whom have you entombed here that you have the right to hew out for yourself a tomb here? He hews out a sepulchre for himself on the height. He carves out a dwelling for himself on the rock. Self-promoting ministry is not of God. Self-promoting leadership is never of God. If the intent of the... Now, I want to say this to you. You can be called of God to be a leader. 
But if your heart is one of self-promotion, then you're, you're disqualifying yourself from an effective ministry. You're not negating your calling, but you're literally making yourself somebody who uh, is actually opposing God because we know that God opposes the proud, doesn't he? And so pride has no place for an authentic kingdom leader. So what business have you got here, God has asked him. He says, behold, the Lord will hurl you, hurl you away violently, O you strong man. Yes, he will take tight hold of you and he will surely cover you with shame. No matter how strong your grip on power is, God will deal with the proud. God will deal with those who abuse their authority or their position. Okay? We've seen that this week, haven't we? In our political uh, system. Okay? You, why abuse power when you can use it for good? But people don't. And Shebna was one of those people. And incidentally, as I said, because he called them a treasurer here, it looks like Shebnam very possibly was embezzling money. Okay, so isn't God's word right on point? Sometimes, I'm going to say this to you, this has just come to me. Sometimes when we start to speak from God's word about something, particularly in relation to the nation, when a word is released in the earth, it can be released to 10,000 people. It can be released to 10 people. It can be released to one person. But sometimes when a servant of God speaks something in the earth, there's a reaction in the earth, in the system in particular, because God is pronouncing judgment. And we started speaking about this last week, about Shebna, and then just the other day we found out about the result of... of Somebody else apparently, or allegedly, should I say, embezzling funds. Abusing power. All right. He will surely roll you up in a bundle and toss you like a ball into a large country. There you will die and there will be your splendid chariots, you disgrace to your master's house. This man disgraced his position. He disgraced his position. He abused his authority. And he tarnished his responsibility. Or he, he, he misused the responsibility he was given. Then he says, And I will thrust you from your office and from your station will you be pulled down. And I want to say this to you. Sometimes that happens when it looks the least likely to happen, when people are so entrenched in power, so entrenched in their position, you think nothing can budge them. We've prayed, we've, we've, we've done all kinds, but the suddenlies of God. And this is what happened to this man, Shebna. Now that's the bad news. There was a bad guy in power and he exerted a lot of power and he abused his position. But here's the good news. And in that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. Eliakim, as I said, means God rises or, or God raises. And it reminds us of Isaiah 60 because we have an Eliakim mandate, I believe, the last day's generation of Christians. There's a, there's a people, there's a generation that God is raising up. Amen. He's raising up. He's Eliakim in us to be the Eliakim generation to be that Isaiah 60 generation, to walk in Isaiah 60 paradigm, to be the people who arise, shine, and the glory of God is seen upon us, and the authority of God is invested in us. Now, every Christian uh, has had that ability. We've seen flashes of it in church history where Christians have realized who they are. See, this is all based on identity. And as my Bible college students will know, identity is destiny. In fact, I think it's so important to, that we're going to put that up. Identity is destiny. Okay? And you, until you know who you are, just double checking it's not a permanent one. <laughs> until you know who you are, you can't really walk in your destiny. Okay? Because destiny flows where identity is known. Okay? If you don't know who you are, how can you function? 
Let's just say somebody found out. Anybody remember that 1980s film, King Ralph? Is it John Goodman? And he's working in America, just a kind of slobby guy. And uh, the, then the, the, the King of England dies or something, or the Queen dies, whatever it was. And they discover he's the heir to the throne. Okay? And he has no knowledge, no experience, no conditioning, no training, no nothing. So, but they bring him over and they try, you know, they try to teach him the ways, the culture of being a king. Now, what I'm saying to you is this, is imagine if you found out right now that you were the heir to the throne and they said to you, well, you need to step up, sit in the throne, rule, reign, we'll bring you the red boxes every day, whatever it is they bring them. You understand? You'd, very ha you'd have to very quickly come up to speed on your new identity. Well, every one of us in this room has been given a new identity, an identity in Christ. And until you understand who you are, first of all, in a, a sense of the general identity that we share in Christ, we're new creations, new creatures, we're more than conquerors, and so on, and, and we know who we are in Christ. That's a general thing for, that each of us share. But also then discover what's God's will for you. What has God called you to do specifically in your very short life here on earth? I mean, I say that, I'm not cursing you. I'm saying to you, you know, no matter how long we live, life is but a vapor, isn't it? Okay? Even for the, the most uh, long-lived of us. Um, you know, you can look back now and say, you know, I, I do these wee mental sums all the time and say, you know, if I went back 40 years and then went back another 40 years, you know, you're in the war type thing, do you know what I mean? So the point I'm trying to say is we have a short life, relatively, even if some of us will live longer than others, maybe. What has God called you to do while you're here? And part of the gathering is discovering what God's called us to do corporately as believers, as the body of Christ, but also to find out, in, in a sense, well, I know the Lord wants me to do this. Okay? And anyway, let's just read on. And that day I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Halkiah, the man that God raised, in other words. And I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your girdle on him and will commit your authority to his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now, what I want to say to you is this, is that this man was, was called to replace corrupt authority, corrupt governance. Brothers and sisters, you and I are exactly the same. Now, you might never be elected as an MP or as a, a, an MSP or as First Minister or Prime Minister. You might never have that in the political system, but here's why you're here as the Ecclesia, as the people of God, to step in and take over when men fail in the kingdom of men. The Bible says the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. And that means, brothers and sisters, and our forefathers knew this, the Covenanters knew this, reformers knew it, the Puritans in England knew it, and other people have known it, is that God has called the Ecclesia to rule and reign in the earth, even if we're never elected to political office. Okay, how do you do that then? You do it by your mouth. You do it in the place of prayer, and you do it when you're given the opportunity to share. And thank God we live in a nation where we're still given the freedom to share. You, there's countries on the earth you're not allowed to share, so all you have is prayer. But brothers and sisters, you and I can have this meeting today, and we can stand up and pray, we can stand up and decree, we can, we can open our mouths and say, this, thus saith the Lord, this is the, the will of God, that his kingdom come and his will be done. Here on earth, here in Scotland, here in Britain, as it is in heaven. That's our freedom, that's, but it's, our, it's our right, but it's also our very, very serious responsibility. So when we look around and see Shebnas, when we look around and see reprobates, when we look around and see ungodly men and women passing laws that go against God's word and that diminish us uh, and defile our status as a Christian nation, and even when they say, well, if you talk like that, we're going to call it a hate crime, who cares? The point being, 
we will stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, and proclaim the kingdom of God. Because it's time for God's people to take over. And you know, you know the, the reason they don't want you meeting and the reason they don't want you praying is because they know if you pray along these lines, they're out of job. If you and I stand up today and say, Father, we will not relent, we will not uh, uh, stop praying until every wicked person is removed from power and they're replaced by a godly man or woman, brothers and sisters, those out there who understand the power of prayer, they won't like that. So it's time to shut the church down again. Or it's time to shut that pastor down. Amen? So th there's a battle to it. There's a, there's a part of this that you have to say, well, I'm up for the fight here because they're not just going to roll over and play dead. And, this, and, and here the prophet, that see, God had to have a prophet release that voice, that word. Go to this treasurer. Go to this contemptible man. Go to this corrupt politician and, or corrupt official and say to him, you're out of job. Now, we're not being arrogant in, if we do that in the place of prayer. Because let me tell you, if we are being arrogant, it will work. We're not even being judgmental in the sense that, well, we are Christians. We're okay with God, but you guys aren't. That's not our heart. It ought never be your heart. And that's why, uh, as we talk about this, our prayers are improve or remove. We pray for someone. We pray that they'll get right with God. We pray that they'll turn to God's word. We pray that they'll turn to Christian leaders and say, please give us your wisdom. But if, they, if they'll not do that, if they'll harden their heart as Pharaoh of old, then it's time to say, the coup de grace. And I want to tell you right now that I, I have prayed politicians out of job. Very suddenly, very, very powerfully. Okay? And let me tell you this, I'm going to just be as blunt as I can. Sometimes when you pray that way, the person is removed not only from their office, but from the earth. We're not praying that. We're not asking for that. But you know, we don't know what goes on sometimes, and, and I think of one person in particular, and then found out that he, he was cursing God as he died. He was prayed out of power, and he cursed God. He was given the opportunity to make his peace with God, literally, and he cursed God. That's the story I was told. Anyway, see, we're not dealing with games here. This is a serious business. Why? Souls are at stake. You know, how many people have committed suicide because the, 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 the law has encouraged things and laws have been created that those people have been uh, damaged by and ended up depressed and suicidal. You know, Rishi Sunak was talking yesterday, I don't know if you heard it, and he spoke a lot about the effect of depression on people and mental health or mental ill health, right? There's a pandemic of that in this nation and much of it is caused by governmental nonsense and wickedness. Anyway, won't be popular with some for saying that, but thank God he that has ears to hear. Let me get through this because I want to take this further today. Uh, I'll clothe him with your robe and I will bind your girdle on him and will commit your authority to his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. What I want to speak about today, brothers and sisters, is this. One word, mindsets. Mindsets determine outcomes. Let me write that up. Mindsets determine outcomes. When I talk about mindsets, I'm not speaking just about intellectual or mental things. I'm talking about mindsets being something that, a, a belief system, if you like, that you have developed in yourself that determines, your, if you have a fearful mindset, then you will be timid and you will attract the things that you don't really want. Job said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. See, Job 
sacrificed every day for his children because he said, just in case they've cursed God, just in case they've backslidden. And he later on said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. He feared that his children would depart God. What happened? His children were wiped out. You see, fear is an attractor just as faith is an attractor. The thing that you greatly believed will come upon you. The thing that you greatly feared will come upon you. Faith and fear are both attractive magnets. Faith attracts the blessing. Fear attracts the curse. Yeah? Perfect love casteth out fear. So we need fear out of our lives. We've looked at that before. But mindsets, if you have a fear-filled mindset, then that will determine an outcome that you won't want. If you have a faith mindset, then that will determine the outcome you want. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Or he could have said this, according to the mindset of faith. If you have a mindset of faith, then the blessings that you desire are going to come to you. He says, what things have you desire? When you pray, believe that you receive them. And when you believe that you receive them, you have a faith mindset. Mindsets determine outcomes. And here's the other thing that we'll look at and we'll, as we go on. Mindsets conquer nations. Mindsets conquer nations. Let me write that up on the board. If I were you, I'd write that, that one down. Mindsets conquer nations. Okay, let me just give you a proof of that. Okay? A simple proof. A proof you'll all understand. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler's mindset conquered Germany, Austria, or that whole region. Mindsets conquer nations. If your mindset is strong enough, it can conquer a whole nation. There's the clue. And I want to say this to you. If you look at this, these three words, mindsets conquer nations, because mindsets determine it. Mindsets conquer nations is the very reason we have the gathering. Because we want to take Scotland for Jesus. We want to take Britain for Jesus. We want the whole of the British Isles to be engulfed with gospel glory and the fire and glory of God. That's our mindset. Now, we're, we're developing that mindset. All of us are. We're all developing it. We're all in the stage of developing a mindset that says, what can we do, Lord, that will conquer this nation for the kingdom of God? We're not looking to hand out rifles here and, and stage a military coup. Now, let me tell you something right now. We've had crazies in here with ideas like that. Amen? <laughs> thinking that, oh, well, we'll just take over. Well, I wouldn't say good luck with that. That just won't work. And even if it could work, you wouldn't want that. If things aren't that bad yet. We're not, we're not at that covenant stage yet. We're not going to uh, start battling at drum clock and the Battle of Bothell Bridge and so on. And, and that's perhaps the mistake the covenanters made. They took up arms when they had the greatest weapon of all in their possession already. This book conquers nations. But it has to be a people that have the capacity to walk in that. Jesus said, any man that puts his hand to the plough and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. You're not fit for purpose if you have an undeveloped and a feeble mindset. Well, you know, I'll, we'll go to church, but the minute it gets too hard, it gets too hot. Now, I use this guy all the time. I've used him in the gathering many times, probably did last week. James Nesbitt. The street up the top there is named after him. James Nesbitt's crime, what he was hung for as a covenanter, was that he attended two or three meetings where he was recognized. He wasn't a leader, he wasn't a preacher, he wasn't, you know, one of the greats. Generals of the Covenanting thing, he was just an attender. And he knew that just by attending meetings, there was a possibility that he could be arrested and lose his life. And he did. He was hung 
just over the road there, at the, where the, the A&E is at the hospital. We're not yet at the stage where they're going to hang you for coming to meetings. But the same murderous spirit is in the earth, the Antichrist spirit. So, and if that is allowed to grow, that's what will happen. People will lose their lives for professing Christ here in Scotland. It's happened before. Thank God. But we're here, brothers and sisters, with the same principle that mindsets conquer nations. So what we're saying is we're developing the mindset that we have to say Scotland is going to fall to King Jesus. And we're going to see the kingdom of God here in Scotland, here in the British Isles. Am I right? Let's read on. Uh, he'll be a father. Now watch this. I want to say this to you, okay? What was it about... Eliakim that God said now there's a prophetic message in here brothers, sisters what was it about Eliakim that God says enough is enough this Shebna guy he needs to go I've got a guy over here that I will raise I'll raise him up in fact I've already named him Eliakim Meaning God will raise. <laughs> what was it about Eliakim that God said, he's the man to replace this dud, this corrupt, contemptible man? What was it about Eliakim that God says, he's the man for this job? Here's the answer, brothers and sisters. Eliakim was developing a mindset of governance that God could trust, that people could trust. So much so, it says here, I will fasten him like a peg or nail in a firm place. He will become, he will become, he will become a throne of honour and glory to his father's house and they will hang on him the honour and the whole weight of responsibility for his father's house. What God is saying here is, this is the guy that will take upon his shoulders the responsibility of kingdom government. He will be the right hand man of the king and the people will be, he will be a father to them. Here's what Eli Eliakim had. He had a fathering mindset Mindsets conquer nations, and if you and I want to conquer this nation, we need a fathering, or I'll say a mothering uh, mindset. In other words, we need to be fathers and mothers to our nation. Now, oh, but we just want revival. Well, I'll tell you what, you can pray and beg and bawl and squall, as we've looked at before. And even if God sent revival, it would, it would be a flash in the pan, as many revivals have been. Now I remember back, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm long enough in the truth as a believer to remember back what they called Toronto back in the 90s. And uh, Toronto, it was known as the Toronto Revival but, or the Toronto Outpouring. But there were actually two streams to it. One was Toronto, the other was Rodney Howard Brown. And, and I was in the Rodney Howard Brown stream, which was different from the Toronto stream. But same, the same Lord, the same, you know, just different streams of what God was doing. But I remember back in those meetings, uh, and I remember, you know, people would fall on the power. I mean, believe you me, there's a lot of stuff going on, okay? Supernatural, glory, power, I'm amazing, some amazing things. But people would be on the floor all the time, trancing out. Amen, it was just, it was a glorious time. But I remember at the time the Lord sent to me, what do you see? The Lord said, do you see the same people week after week? On the floor. Shaka Mundo. Oh. Do you see them? I said, yes. He said, well, what are they coming forward for? I said, well, you know, a touch. The Lord said, I don't put them on the floor doing all that for just to 
give them a touch from me. He says, I'm trying to get something into them. I'm trying that when they come up from the floor, they're stronger, that they're, they have a, a more developed, stronger spirit man. And this is, these are the words the Lord said to me. He says, but so many of them, all they come for is a Holy Ghost tummy tickle. They just want me to tickle their tummy. Oh, I feel so good, Lord. It felt so good. Oh, shut the window. He said, do you see change? I said, no. He says, do you see some of them actually getting more and more immature? I said, absolutely. Because they relied on that. And that's why it lifted. Whatever God does for you and I is meant to make us more mature and more developed in our mindset. You see, we're not talking here about intellectual or mental things because a kingdom mindset is supernatural. A kingdom mindset is a revelation knowledge mindset. A kingdom mindset is God pouring into us wisdom from above. Pouring in glory thinking. Pouring in kingdom mindset. Does that make sense? And so God's saying, this guy, Eliakim, brothers and sisters, hear the word of the Lord to you. This guy, Eliakim, cannot be ignored anymore. Because he's developed his mindset to a place, not only is he ready, but it's necessary for him to fulfill the position. It's necessary that this Shebna eventually gets moved out and goes into obscurity and goes into a place of shame and dishonor and oblivion even, eventually. Why? Because the Eliakim has to come forth. The people of God have to come forth. Well, Lord, send revival. Well, I'll send revival when you have the mindset that can handle it. That's why Toronto died out. That's why many revivals do. But God is saying, you have to increase your capacity. You have to develop a mindset that can conquer Scotland, but then maintain Scotland. It won't just be a few years or a few decades, but if you want revival, you have to have the mindset for it. You have to develop the capacity to walk in it. According to your mindset, according to your capacity, according to your consciousness, according to your faith, be it unto you. Oh, send revival, Lord. Well, that's good, I'll send revival. But are you ready? Are you ready? See, I don't know about you, and I'm told this. I'm, I'm an impatient man. Am I right? I want to pray for revival now, and it be here by the time the food's served. And maybe some of you are like that. Amen? We want, uh, uh, revival now. And there's an element of it where now faith is, now is the day of salvation. God wants us in that posture all the time. And so there's an element that we can, we can walk in it right now by just deciding to walk in it right now. Because the mindset that God is looking for is kingdom now, revival now, multitudes now, harvest now. Now, Lord. Now, Lord, send prosperity. Now, Lord, do it. But we have to maintain that posture and develop ourselves so that we become we, what we've just prayed. Eh, sorry, what we've just sang. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Now, Lord, I'm ready now, Lord. Send a revival. Start that work in me. Amen? Now, here's the thing I'm trying to say. If you believe that that prayer, if you like, from that hymn, if you believe that that, that can be your reality, then that's the mindset that can conquer a nation. But if you say, nah, it won't be me. Uh, I'm not ready. I'm not. God's going to use a great and mighty man or woman of God. I'm happy to be part of it all, Lord. I'm happy to be involved in some capacity. We have to develop the mindset, which is really just 
another word for faith level, to say, start the work in me. Start it in James, start it in Liga, start it in other people, but start it in me. And I believe I receive it. And for, as I walk out this place today, I am revival on legs. William Booth, the founder of General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, famously said, I'm not looking for a move of God. I am a move of God. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for God to do something somewhere, sometime, somehow. I am a move of God right now. That's a mindset, brothers and sisters. There's a mindset and here's the thing I want to say to you as well. Mindsets attract. Mindsets attract. Or let me put it another way. Mindsets are magnets. Mindsets are magnets. There's a revival mindset that is a magnet for revival. There's a healing mindset or a, a, that there is a magnet for healing. And what is that mindset? What is that magnet? It's simply faith. Jesus said, O ye of little faith. Which means, ye of an underdeveloped mindset. Remember, mindsets determine outcomes. Mindsets conquer nations. Look at everything that's going on in our nation right now and across the nations. It's all the same ideology. It's all the same things that they're trying to usher in and bring in. Look at things like 15-minute cities and all the... Mindsets. Ideas that people come up with and say, and what did they say? We're going to promote this till everybody follows it and believes it and accepts it and receives it. So that when they tell you that this is how gender works, this is how sexuality works, this is how that works, this is how, okay, when they tell you, what are they giving you? They're giving you a mindset. We call it woke ideology. Ideology is just another word for mindset. When you accept there are 75 genders, even if there's only two, you've accepted a mindset. You've allowed that mindset to impose on you. And brothers and sisters, they are very vicious in imposing their mindset on you and I. It's not enough just to say, well, we'll let you believe there are 75 genders. But they have to impose that on you and I. That if we say, well, there's only two, oh, oh, here we go. And do you know something? When you don't accept their mindset, they have a word for it. Hate. It's a hate crime to not accept the mindset of our Babylonian Antichrist rulers. Now, let's pass out the rifle. Someone might say, well, you know, that's not going to work. And even if it did, that's not the, the way. That's not what they fear. This is what they fear. Why? This book is full of mindsets. I put them all together. It's the will of God, which is unopposed in heaven. And God said, just you speak that into the earth and keep speaking it. Well, we're going to throw you in prison. We're going to take away your livelihood. We're going to do everything that we can to shut you up. Well, good luck with that. Because even in prison, and in fact, if you throw us in prison, you're giving us time to pray that we don't have right now. We're busy lives. So when we're in prison, we're going to say every day, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because that's our mindset. We have a kingdom mindset. And sooner or later, doesn't matter how long it takes, we are going to be victorious in the earth. And the ultimate victory, of course, is when Jesus splits the skies. But in the meantime, it's still our mindset that we will impose God's kingdom and God's will upon the nations in the place of prayer. That God will break down all opposition and that people will, will respond and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says one day everyone will have the mindset that Jesus is Lord. Because it says every knee shall bow. 
Oh, but all these principalities and powers and demons were fighting them all. Let me just show you something from God's word. In fact, before we do that, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 45. I want to show you something here because I spoke about a fathering mindset. There's a fathering mindset, brothers and sisters, that takes nations. Now think about this man, Joseph. Joseph, in a similar thing to Eliakim, a little bit more severe in a sense, is that here's a man called Joseph who is given a mindset from a very early age through the dream of the coat of many colours. Joseph, everybody's going to bow down to you, including your own family. They're going to bow to you. You're, you've got a dominion, kingdom mindset. And he told his brothers and his parents. And look what happened. They sold him into slavery. Then he goes to Potiphar's household and God develops that mindset in him because Potiphar was a high-ranking Egyptian official and clearly uh, Joseph being his servant in his house, he, he was exposed to the ways of Egyptian government and he probably got to know a lot of Potiphar's friends and uh, colleagues and he was serving Potiphar, serving them. So he got to know the ways of government and governance in that place of Egypt. And then, of course, eventually he was falsely accused, thrown into prison. But even in prison, he's got such an excellent spirit. He's got such a mindset about him that they, they let him run the prison. But there came a point, brothers and sisters, where his mindset... His consciousness, his level of faith and confidence and so on in his God and his vision. He never turned loose his faith. faith. He always kept it, kept it topped up, kept it developed. There came a point where God says, enough of this. This man with this mindset, this fathering mindset has to come out of this prison and take his place in the kingdom of men. How do we know that Joseph had a fathering mindset? Here it tells us, Genesis chapter 45 and verse 8. Look what it says. He's speaking here to his brothers. And he says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. And lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Similar to Eliakim, Pharaoh, sorry, Joseph was Pharaoh's right hand man. Eliakim was the king of Judah's right hand man. I think it was Hezekiah was the king at the time. He says he's made me a father to the most powerful man on earth. He's made me a father. To Pharaoh. At that time, Egypt was the, the world's superpower. He's made me a father to the most powerful man on earth. I, I, he's, he's, he's Pharaoh, but I am actually, I'm his father. I'm a spiritual father. I'm the man he turns to for, to for advice. I'm the man, his right hand man. I run it all. And he loves my wisdom. He loves what God is doing in my life. So much so, I'm like a father to this man. He's like a boy to me. You know, Pharaoh might have been older than Joseph. But God had raised Joseph, even above Pharaoh. In the respect of having spiritual authority. Do you see that? The fathering mindset is part of what conquers nations. It's not just a dominion mindset to say, well, I'm going to be a boss here, I'm going to rule things, blah, 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 blah. That's not the mindset. Why? Because uh, that mindset is, is, we don't want a mercenary mindset. We don't want an obsessed with power mindset. We want a shepherding, fathering mindset that says I'm a servant, but I've got more wisdom than all these guys around about me. But I'm staying humble. When they start knocking your door, brothers and sisters, for the wisdom that comes out of your mouths, that's what you need to believe because 
That's what happened to Joseph. They actually went to prison and took a man who was accused of a very grievous crime and was doing the punishment for that crime. And they said, take this man out of prison and not just give him a job, put him in the kitchen so that he could wash dishes. They said, make him prime minister. And Pharaoh says, here, here's my ring. You've got my authority. Wow. God wants to do that for every person in this room. There's a spiritual side to this, of course. We're not talking about, you know, that we're all going to go to number 10 down in street. But in the spirit, God wants to give us that level of authority to say, Who, who's going to be Pharaoh? Not some reprobate Lord, we're not having him. Stevie and I spoke about this a while back. We had a very powerful, I think he had the dream, that it, it, he had the dream that, that we determined, we the people of God determined who would be in power the next Prime Minister. This was a while back. Who wouldn't be? And the Lord, in the dream, gave us the choice to say, could this man uh, come back into power? And we said no, and it didn't happen. Although it was supposed to happen. We determine, brothers and sisters, not in an arrogant, cocky, conceited, proud way. It ought to make you more humble to understand that we have that level of authority. To turn around and say, we're not having wicked people, Lord. We demand that the righteous be raised into power. Remove the wicked, replace them with the godly. That's a general prayer. God has made me a father to Pharaoh. And then, let's turn to Genesis chapter 17. I want to prove to you here today that God raises up fathering leaders. There's a mindset to govern and conquer nations. And you say, well, that's good for national leaders. Brothers and sisters, every person in this room is a national leader in the respect of we have authority before the throne of God to determine outcomes in our nation. But I want to say this to you. If you don't believe that we have that level of authority, then that mindset is not yet developed. Well, we can beg and bawl and squall. That's not done much for believers. Genesis 17, okay? And verses 4 and 5. Let's just look at it. God is speaking to Abraham. And what's God's answer to Abraham that makes Abraham the father of faith to those who believe today? Because that's what the Bible says. It says that you and I are father as Abraham. If Abraham's not your father, I've got bad news, you're not in Christ. Go read Galatians chapter 3. You can only be uh, in Christ if Abraham's your father. Look what he says. Verse 3, Abraham fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a what? A father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, which means father of many nations, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you want the nations, you have to be a father to nations or you have to be a mother to nations. Sarah was the mother. Isaiah chapter 51, look to the rock, look to Abraham and to Sarah who bore you. Abraham and Sarah are what God is saying, I've made them fathers, I've made them mothers, and I gave them a miracle child because they couldn't conceive. And what God's saying to you and I today is this, is that we're blessed with faithful Abraham, and part of our mindset has to be the fathering mindset that God says, Eliakim, oh, he's going to be a father to, to Judah and Jerusalem. <laughs> he's, going to be, he's not going to be like that other guy that I've just booted out the mercenary, the hireling, the money-obsessed uh, prestige uh, freak. This guy's going to put the people 
and the purpose of God and the kingdom before everything else. God's looking for people today who will say, I don't, I'm not seeking prestige, renown, fame, money. I'm just seeking the will of God for my nation. I'm seeking the will of God in my nation. I'm seeking harvest. I'm looking for sons and daughters. I'm looking for God to move. I'm looking for the kingdom to arise and, and completely dominate the kingdom of darkness and drive it out and people be set free in the name of Jesus, by the gospel. And then Genesis chapter 18. Well, you know, God made, he said he made Abraham a father. And it, well, look at Genesis 18, verse 19 says this. God's speaking about Abraham. Watch this, verse 18. No, verse 17. The Lord said, Yahweh said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Let me ask you, is God going to hide from us how he's going to move in the earth today? Oh, you never know what God's going to do. Yes, you do. Because you read his word and you listen to his spirit. Okay? It's not a mystery in the sense of, oh, well, well, you never know. Oh, yeah, you do. God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he says this, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. If you're blessed and faithful Abraham, then every nation on the earth is meant to be blessed in and through you. Amen? Isn't that good news? We should be running around these seats, jumping up and down, because God wants to bless the nations through you and I, because we are the children of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is upon us. That's part of your identity, so therefore it's part of your destiny. And if you have the mindset, I'm blessed with faithful Abraham, Abraham's blessing is mine. If you have that mindset, then that mindset will conquer nations because God said Abraham is the heir of the world, Romans chapter 4. Abraham is the heir of the world. And that means that you and I inherit the nations just like Abraham and his seed, Jesus. And we're the seed of Abraham because we're in Christ. But look what this says here. For I know him, God says that he will command his children and his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God's saying, I know this guy, he has a fathering mindset. This guy will train and teach and impart to his descendants that which I have taught him. Now let me close with this today. And then that'll be our final scripture today, folks. Matthew chapter 28. I feel the Lord wants me to squeeze this one in. Matthew 28. Verse 16. The eleven disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. How, how much power? All power. <coughs> if Jesus has all power, how much does the devil have? Does all power mean all power, or is Jesus exaggerating? Oh, he was prone to exaggeration, that Jesus guy. Come on, folks. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word teach is, dis is translated in, I think it's the New King James or Disciple all nations. Go ye therefore and disciple all nations. Baptize in them. That doesn't just mean water baptism. It means to immerse them, to engulf them. With what? With the thinking of God. Remember that we looked in Psalm 67 that, that we were to teach God's salvation to all nations. What's he saying here? He's saying go and tell them that uh, the Abrahamic blessing is this is that there has to be a mindset that they have to enter into. You have to teach them that mindset. When you go to school, the teacher teaches you their mindset, don't they? If the maths teacher teaches you history, then you'll have a history mindset. If the history teacher teaches you maths, then you'll have a maths mindset. But you teach the mindset that you've been trained in. We've been trained in the ways of the kingdom. So we train nations in kingdom ways. Why? Because we impart and teach 
a kingdom mindset. Remember the first night of Arise Scotland? I think some of you were there. And Bert came and he says, we've done a great job of the Mark 16 Great Commission. Preach the gospel to every creature. But we haven't done a great job of the Matthew 28 one, which is to disciple nations. Mindsets conquer nations, or we could say mindsets disciple nations. So when communists come and people of other ideologies come and say, we're going to teach you a new way of living with umpteen genders, different ways of looking at life, different ways of interpreting things. What do you say? That's not a mindset I accept. Well, I'll throw you in jail for not accepting it. Throw me in jail all you want. They threw Joseph in jail. And he came out prime minister. Why? Because you can't kill a kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset will conquer a nation eventually. The Covenanters, they, they killed many of them for their mindset, their belief. But what they, they believed for came to pass. The freedom of worship, the freedom to express their faith, that came. And governance came that was far more in line with God's word. The glorious revolution, they called it. Brothers and sisters, mindset. I want to say this to you. Yes, mindsets conquer nations, good or bad. But kingdom mindset is what we, kingdom mindsets is what we need to conquer the nations of the earth. The Lord bless you.